Welcome to the final lecture in this class. Uh, this one uh, is the third one in the uh, group dealing with spatial clustering, spatially constrained clustering, and now we consider um, partitioning methods. And we're going to look at two methods. One is fairly old, automatic zoning procedure, or AZP, uh, mostly associated with the work of Stan Openshaw, and the other one is a fairly recent um, development, MAXP. Uh, the MAXP approach is different from all the other ones we've seen so far in that it determines the number of regions, the number of clusters, K, endogenously. AZP stands for Automatic Zoning Procedure, or initially Automatic Zoning Problem, so the idea is the same as before. We need to group n observations into p contiguous uh, regions. This is a very difficult problem. It's an np hard problem, um, and we'll use a partitioning approach, which is a you know, allocation approach, iterative reallocation approach, and the. Initial AZP algorithm was an aggressive, greedy, hill-climbing heuristic. Um, greedy in the sense that it tries, tries to improve on the solution at each iteration. We've seen this concept before. And <clears throat> because, as you'll see in a few minutes, the AZP algorithm as such is actually quite slow, um, a number of improvements have been suggested to speed it up or to also avoid uh, falling into local optima uh, as much as possible. So uh, these, the two in particular that I'll very briefly consider, the as always, the technical details are in the lab notes, uh, are simulated <coughs> annealing and taboo search. Okay, what is the heuristic? It's actually very simple. Um, you start with any feasible solution, so any set of P regions uh, that are internally contiguous, and then you start swapping. In, in essence, what you do is you take, randomly you take a region, and you start looking at all the bordering units and see for each of these bordering units if by moving it into the region, you get an improvement of the uh, objective function, which is, as always, uh, minimizing the internal um, discrepancy the within summer squares. So we do this over and over and over again until there's no more improvement. At that point, we may have reached a local optimum, but there is no guarantee of a global optimum. So. That's the heuristic behind AZP. Um, let me illustrate this with our Arizona example again, and I'm just going to mimic the logic. We start with a feasible solution. Let's say P is four, the number of regions is four. Here's a solution with four regions. And now we're going to randomly pick one of those four regions, and in our case, the light green one, and then make a list of its neighbors. So we randomly pick a region and make a list of all the neighbors of that region. And so here's our list B. And now we're going to systematically randomly pick one of, from this list until the list is exhausted, except that as we make improvements to our region, we may have to add new neighbors that are not part of the original list, as I'll show in a second. So let's say we randomly pick this region, and then we randomly select one from the list of neighbors, and then we go through a number of evaluation steps. Does picking this um, neighbor break contiguity in another region? Um, if that's the case, we do not swap. If it's not the case, so the other region is, remains internally contiguous, then we swap. Um, does it improve the, ob then we consider it for a swap. Does it improve the objective function? If it does not, we move on to the next one. If it does, then we make the swap and update the neighbor list. And 
as we move through the neighbor list, even though it's updated each time we swap in regions, uh, at some point we'll exhaust it. Then we pick another region and build its neighbor list and move through that. And we keep doing this until there's no more improvement. So we keep exhausting the regions and their neighbor lists. And then we start over, pick another region and start doing this and keep doing it as long as we get improvement. And at some point we stop. So it's a very simple principle. It's kind of laborious. It can get us trapped in local optima very easily. So here's our, um, remember, our example, randomly, quote unquote, pick this region with the neighbor list. So now we're going to randomly pick number two from this list of neighbors. And number two, if we would pick number two, that would break the contiguity in this region, in this cluster. So we reject the two. We move on to the next one. The next one is 14. As it turns out, adding 14 does not improve the objective function. So we skip it. We take another one. And three, finally, does improve the objective function. But now we have to add nine to the neighbor list because nine was not originally part of the neighbor list. And so then we continue going through until this process stabilizes. So it's a very simple principle. It's a greedy hill climbing uh, heuristic, but you can see how it's kind of involved and there can be a lot of circularity, uh, swapping and re-swapping and so on. So that in part is one of its strengths because unlike the approach for Skater and Redcap, which were based on hierarchical groupings, which once you had them, you couldn't change. You couldn't move a unit from one grouping to another grouping. In the partitioning methods, you can. So there's an increased flexibility. Okay, so the hill climbing heuristic, as nice and easy as it may be, can easily be trapped in local optima. So one way to deal with this is to not be as greedy. And in other, in other words, not always pick the most improving move, but to allow non-improving moves. Now, if you allow too many non-improving group, non-improving moves, then you're not going to improve. So that's, there has to be a limit to that. So in the one method, simu simulated annealing, the um, probability of allowing a non-improving move decreases with how many you do. In the other method, the taboo search, there is a, uh, a limit on the number of swaps that you can carry out. So where, where you do move from A to B, then the move from B to A is limited for a number of steps. And you're allowed to make some non-improvement moves, but only so many. So both of these try to get you out of a local minimum by just kind of moving over a little bit worse and then it gets better again you know so if you think of the two mountaintops let's say you get stuck on one mountaintop the lower one that this would allow you to get down again into the valley and then climb up the bigger mountain um, otherwise you're stuck at the peak of the lower mountain and so then the second approach of to improve this is that um, as you might have realized a lot depends on your starting position. Uh, remember, we only require that it is a feasible solution. We don't require that it is a good feasible solution. So that aspect is addressed in the RSL approach, which essentially uses a k-means plus plus logic to find the initial starting points. Remember, with k-means plus plus, we start we pick the points so that we have a very nice coverage of the full region and then pick the one with the best uh, you know, performance in terms of within sum of squares. So we're going to do a similar thing here to get a better uh, starting point, a better initial set of feasible regions to then apply our greedy or simulated annealing or taboo search to.
So let's look at these um, in a little more detail. As I mentioned, the mathematical details are spelled out in the notebook. So simulated annealing is just another word for the metropolis algorithm, which some of you who've done Bayesian statistics may know as the main, uh, one of the main ways to carry out uh, Monte Carlo, uh, Markov chain, um, Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation to estimate, to find posterior distributions for estimators. So it's all the same thing. In essence, uh, there is this equation called the Boltzmann equation. This all comes out of physics, um, where it has to do with actual cooling of a process. So these terms are used here, but in essence, it's, it's kind of easy to get the gist of it. So we have this R, which is a uniform random number. So we just draw a number between 0 and 1. And then we compute the right-hand side as a function of the change, the relative change in the objective function, and the quote-unquote temperature. The temperature is typically a number between 0 and 1. And the temperature is stacked by iteration, and with additional iterations, the temperature gets lowered. So the temperature at iteration k is a fraction, the so-called cooling rate, of the temperature at the previous iteration. So what does this do? The mathematics, as I mentioned, are a bit complicated, but the essence of it is not. It's actually very intuitive. What we're doing is by lowering this t here, the magnitude on the left-hand side becomes a smaller number. And as the number gets smaller, the chances that we get a uniform random number that is less than the smaller number go down and down. Because for a uniform random number between 0 and 1, the uh, average, the mean, is 1 half, it's 0.5. So as we make this number on the left-hand side, that the uniform number has to be less than, as we make this smaller, the chances that this constraint is satisfied go decrease. So um, as a result, we can carry out non-improvement, non-improving moves, but with a, a probability that decreasing as the temperature goes down, that decreases as the temperature goes down. So then um, we only do this for a limited number of iterations. So there's some important parameters for the simulated annealing algorithm, namely the cooling rate and the number of non-improvement, non-improving uh, moves that we allow. So uh, that's one way of allowing us to move out of potential local uh, optima. The other method is called taboo search. And as I mentioned, the, the greedy hill climbing heuristic uh, behind the initial AZP will re result in a lot of the same units being moved back and forth between regions. And to avoid that, um, anytime you make a move, let's say we move um, a, a region into a, a unit into the region, then moving that unit out of the region back into another region is not allowed for a number of iterations. And the number of iterations that it's not allowed is called the taboo length. So the logic is, um, if you find a move, we, we use the exact same algorithm as before. We, we go to a random region, we pick the neighbors, and we go through the neighbors. If they um, you know, don't break contiguity and improve on the objective function, we make the move, but then the reverse move goes into the taboo list. If the best possible move does not improve, then we go to the taboo list and we call the first possible uh, taboo move that is available the aspirational move. If it improves, then we do it. If it doesn't improve, then forget, we forget about it and we go back to our original moves and take the best non-improving move. But we're only allowed to do this a limited number of times. So the idea is, first of all, that we put a limit on the number of re reverse swaps that are allowed. 
but also that we allow in a move that does not immediately improve the objective function, but we only allow so many of these. That's the non-improving moves. Then finally, RSL stands for automatic regionalization with initial seed location is just an improvement on the initial search. So one way to get your initial feasible regions is to just randomly pick uh, K or P seeds and then grow the regions and then start with that. Now you can repeat this process many, many times and in any implementation of AZP that's actually done. And then just like with k-means, we pick the initial starting point that has the best performance on the within sum of squares. And uh, what RSL does is it uses the same logic but uses a k-means mean, plus plus approach to find the initial starting points. And it does that a number of times, just like in K means plus plus, and then picks the best one as the starting point. So uh, we improve where we start from, but then everything else is the same as before. It's, you know, greedy hill climbing, or it's simulated annealing, or it's a taboo search. And just to illustrate how sensitive the results are, this is something that is uh, a bit, or can be, a bit disconcerting in that um, depending on how you set these parameters, you can get very different results. And um, so for AZP and um, the regular AZP and local search RSL, the starting points are critical. For simulated annealing, we have to pick the cooling rate and the maximum number of non-improvement, non-improving moves. For taboo search, we have to pick the length, the taboo length, and also the number of non-improving moves. So these are very important parameters. Just to show you, give you an idea of the type of effect that may have on the solution, here are a couple of illustrations. So AZP, greedy hill climbing, the default setup, we get an end result that gives us 0 0.431. If we use RSL, to get a better initial starting point, we get a ratio that is slightly better. Not much better, but slightly better. And we see that the actual resulting clusters are slightly different. You know, here we have two uh, singletons, here we have no singletons. And, and the, the upper, this region is basically the same, not identical, but basically the same as this one. Same here, this is a little bit larger in this solution. And then here, it's essentially the same, except that this, this whole part uh, becomes replaced by a singleton. So um, sensitivity analysis, very important. The next set of comparisons is um, using simulated annealing and to illustrate the effect of the cooling rate. So the solution on the left gives the default setting of 0.85 for the cooling rate. And on the right, after some experimentation, we get a much better result, 0.47, using a cooling rate of 0.8. And then finally, for the taboo search, the taboo length on the right is much uh, longer, and the number of non-improving moves that are allowed is also much larger. And again, we see a pretty um, dramatic improvement. So of all these different solutions, um, 0 0.3, 0 0.36, basically the same, uh, 0 0.33, uh, 433, and 478 in simulated annealing, and 433 and 467. So of all these six solutions, the one with the cooling rate of 0 0.8 in simulated annealing gave by far the best result. So as I said, this can be a little disconcerting, but what it really means is that you should not just take the default settings. You absolutely have to experiment with different values of these parameters to see the effect that this might have on the solution and the extent to which it changes major features of the solution. For example, we keep getting the same block of departments in the north in most solutions, so that's pretty robust.
to these different parameters. On the other hand, in the middle part of the country, we, we see quite a bit of shuffling around. So that's the kind of thing we have to address with sensitivity analysis. Then the final method that I consider in this class is MAXP. It's a fairly recent method. It you know, uh, was developed in, within the last 10 years. Um, the difference between this and all the other methods is that the number of regions becomes endogenous. So it's the same problem of grouping n areas into um, p regions, but now p is unknown and becomes part of the solution. And of course, there's no free lunch. If you say, I'm not going to preset p, then something else has to give. And the other thing that has to give is that we put a minimum threshold on the size of the cluster. And that minimum threshold is what we call a spatially extensive variable, something like total population, total number of households, total area. You know, so this puts a minimum size limit on the clusters that we obtain, because otherwise, just think about it for a second, what would be the solution that maximizes P that's a solution where each observation is its own cluster. So that's not useful. So we have to put a constraint in there to avoid this nonsensical result. And that is how we um, solve the problem. And then we impose, of course, in along the way, a contiguity constraint. So we can only end up with regions that are contiguous. And then among those contiguous regions, we try to find the one that has the largest P. Now, this is not necessarily the best solution, but is a solution. So anytime you put constraints, then you actually kind of take out some flexibility. So by putting in a minimum size for the cluster, we take out some flexibility. And so the, the one that has the largest P may not be necessarily the best one on some other criteria, as we've seen before. Anytime you impose constraints, you pay a price for that. And this is something that can be evaluated. So we get a contiguity, but not necessarily compactness. So one of the kind of side effects of max P is that can, you can end up with these snake-like regions that are indeed each contiguous, but not necessarily compact. So how do we solve this strategy, this um, problem? Just like the other ones, it's NP-hard, there's no analytical solution. So the first solution we came up with was a mixed integer programming formulation, MIP. So integer programming is a form of linear programming where the solution has to be an integer rather than a continuous number. And it's used uh, in many, many, uh, it has wide range of application, for example, in location analysis, finding optimal locations. The objective function for the max p uh, problem is characterized by really, it, it's really a multi-objective function. There's two objectives. One is the number of regions. We want that to be as large as possible. And the other one is the within sum of squares and the clusters, which we want to have as small as possible. So in a way, these two fight. And so we have to set it up in such a way that first of all, we will always prefer a solution with a larger p over one with a smaller p. And for the same value of p, obviously we want the solution with the best within sum of squares with the greater degree of homogeneity. And the way this is set up, and again, the mathematical details are beyond the scope here, but the way this is set up is to avoid actually a competition between solutions that are for different numbers of p. So we really want to find the largest p as possible. And then among those solutions with that p, it basically becomes an AZP problem, an AZP-like problem where we try to find the best allocation of the n um, observations into the p region. So that, that's in a nutshell how max p works. Now, as it turns out, the mixed integer programming approach doesn't scale well. It's, it's limited to fairly small problems. And to scale this up to more realistic size problems, 
we developed some heuristics. And again, as with all the heuristics, there's no guarantee of a global optimum. With um, max p in particular, this can be very disconcerting in that different starting points, different parameters can give very different results, as I will illustrate in, in a few minutes. Um, the basics of the um, algorithm are three stages. The first stage is a growth. So essentially, we find um, feasible solutions. And unlike in the previous cases where we knew P ahead of time, so we started with P seeds and then grew those to feasible solutions, now P is a variable. So we grow the feasible solutions to find the one with the largest P. That is the initial stage. So we, we grow until we get the largest P and then some observations haven't been assigned. So then those are called enclaves. Then we assign them to the P clusters that we have. At that point, we have an initial feasible solution. And then the next steps are exactly the same as with AZP. So we have a greedy hill climbing, we have simulated annealing, or we have taboo search. So in essence, that's how it works. Um, let me illustrate again with our Arizona example <clears throat> how these, um, this works. So the initial phase, the construction phase, as we call it, grows the feasible solution, um, assigns the enclaves. So in essence, what we're going to do is randomly pick a location, um, see if it meets the minimum threshold criterion, then pick one of its neighbors, merge them, check if it meets the minimum threshold cr criterion, and so forth, until we meet the criterion. Then we stop, then we pick another random starting point and do the same thing until we've kind of exhausted the space. And then the enclaves, or you know, the um, orphans, uh, uh, as you wish, get assigned to a cluster such that the within sum of squares is minimized. And then um, we have an initial feasible solution. In the next uh, phase, we do the same as for AZP. We improve that uh, solution. So um, back to our Arizona County example. And I've used the population in 1990 as a, a criterion to um, find a minimum threshold of 250,000. So as you can see, a couple of these counties like Maricopa County and Pima County, Maricopa is where Phoenix is, Pima is where Tucson is, these by themselves already satisfy that criterion, but the others do not. So the others would have to be grouped with others. This may remind you a little bit of the scan statistics where uh, for the um, Kuldorf scan statistic, we used a critical population size and we aggregated until we were there. Here we basically do the same kind of thing. So let's say we randomly pick number six. Six has a population of 8,000, nowhere near enough to um, satisfy the criterion. Um, then we look at its neighbors and the largest neighbor is two, but two and six together do not yet mean meet the criterion. So then we put two and six together and augment the neighbor list with 11 and 13, because those are neighbors of two. And then we find that if we merge 11 with two and six, we meet the threshold. So that's region number one. Then we do the same, pick region number two, that is um, Maricopa County, and that meets the threshold. So we have two regions now. Then we pick region number three and do the same thing, and region number four and do the same thing. So now we're done. We have found the value of P where we can proceed no further. Everything that's left is an enclave, and now we have to decide which cluster to assign these enclaves to, which of their contiguous regions we assign them to. So we assign them in such a way that the, the total within sum of squares is minimized, 
and the end result is something like this. So now we have an initial feasible solution um, ready to go with either greedy hill climbing, simulated annealing, or taboo. From here on out, it's exactly the same as AZP. And as in AZP, the results are fairly sensitive on how we approach this. So the initial starting solution, the initial feasible solution will determine what P is. So as we try more random possibilities, remember we pick these random regions to start growing, ran I mean randomly. So if we repeat this multiple times, we, in a sense, cover more of the possibilities and then have a greater chance of finding a solution that actually maximizes P rather than be stuck in a local optimum. So that's, that's the rationale behind trying many different starting solutions. Obviously, the threshold value, the population cutoff is going to play a role in what maximum P we can obtain. And everything else is just the same as for AZP. So we have the cooling rate for uh, simulated annealing. We have the taboo length for taboo search and so on. Just to give you an idea of the effect of this on the solutions and a sense of, again, this uh, can make someone uncomfortable because depending on you do how you do this, you can get different results. I mean... That's just the nature of the beast. Um, because you get local optima, you do not have any assurance that you have the best solution. So uh, as a result, you have to do sensitivity analysis, try different combinations and see the effect of these combinations on the solution that you obtain. So this is the standard solution uh, with all the defaults using uh, greedy hill climbing we get a P of 8. So the maximum number of endogenous spatially contiguous regions is 8. Um, the ratio that we get of between to total summer squares is 4, uh, 0.42. Okay. So now we look at the taboo search and we manipulate the taboo length. This is the default setting. We get 489. And with more iterations to start with and a longer um, set of uh, allowing non-improving uh, solutions, we can get 5.526. So that's quite an improvement. With simulated annealing, we the default situation gives us 8. But if we increase the number of initial iterations to almost 10,000, then we're actually able to find an initial feasible solution with nine regions, even though the end result in terms of total uh, ratio of between to total is not as good as the solutions with eight because of the constraints, we do get a larger number of regions. So if our primary objective is to maximize the number of regions, this is a good result. If our primary objective is to maximize the ratio of between two total sub-squares for p equal 8, this is not a good result. So these are the kinds of things you have to keep in mind when carrying out max p. It's, it's not easy and sensitivity anal analysis is key. Okay, so this brings us to the end of this series of lectures. We started with point patterns, we saw density-based clustering, clusters for rates, and then we moved into dimension reduction, classic clustering, and finally we ended up with spatially constrained clustering. As I mentioned in the introduction, the range of cluster methods is huge, but I hope that I've given you a taste of the different kinds of important approaches that can be taken to uh, solve this problem. Good luck with your project and see you later. Bye-bye.